Good evening and welcome to the webinar on why STEM is for non-STEMers, an art graduate's inside story. This webinar is co-organized by the STEM Alliance, Scientix and OneStream. My name is Ivana Kovac and I'm a STEM Alliance coordinator at European Schoolnet based in Brussels and it's my great pleasure to host you all today. Before introducing our speakers, let me go through some housekeeping rules. This webinar will finish at 6 p.m. and it is being recorded. It will be published on the STEM Alliance platform for you to be able to rewatch at your convenience. Please know that your camera and microphone have been disabled and there is my co colleague Rocio in chat today with us to help you with any technical issues that may arise. If needed, please reach out to her in the chat window. Rocio is also sharing in the chat a link to the signature list, so please sign it as it's a mandatory document if you wish to receive the certificate of participation for this event. Also, please note that only those who have signed the list will receive the certificate. And finally, our speakers will be answering your questions throughout the webinar, the, the event, but please make sure you post your questions in the chat and we will relay them to uh, our speakers after in the Q&A session. And now let me tell you something about our speakers and introduce them. OneStream provides a market leading intelligent finance platform that reduces the complexity of financial operations. And as a technology leader in their field, their vision is a world where finance departments can use modern software to not only transform business, but life itself. And through career talks and other volunteer activities, they seek to inspire and equip young people to pursue skills and lifelong careers in STEM. And let's welcome today Hannah, Nick and Matt. And thank you all so much for being here with us today, presenting and discussing. And first, when it comes to our agenda, we will have welcome Hannah Trainer, Junior Marketing Specialist from OneStream Software, who will tell us more about her background and experience she gained during the internship in OneStream. After Hannah, we will hear from Matt Kerslake, lead technical education consultant, who will tell us about his work path, but also his great involvement he has had in the UK STEM community. Then we will welcome Nick O'Connor, OneStream's HR business partner, who will tell us more about how to help students for job interviews and assist them with writing CVs. And after Nick's presentation, we will go back to Hannah one more time to hear her closing remarks. And after that, we will have time for your questions. As I have mentioned, you will be able to post your questions throughout the webinar in the chat, and we will address them later in the Q&A session. So please take this opportunity and share your thoughts with us. Also in the chat box, we will share a link to some tips and tricks OneStream has prepared for our teachers, and I hope you will find it very useful. And now, it's time to hear from our speakers. Hannah, thank you very much for being here with us today. The floor is all yours. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's so great to be here today. Um, as Ivana said, my name is Hannah and I work at OneStream. Um, I initially joined OneStream as an intern as part of their internship program after my arts degree. Um, and I was hired by the company full time in October. Um, so it's really exciting for us to explore in this webinar with you all today why STEM is for non-STEMers, um, for people who don't consider a career in STEM as something that is um, accessible to them, um, which is definitely how I felt um, before I started the internship. Um, so just to give a brief overview um, of our webinar, um, it will be structured in four small parts, as Ivana said. Um, I'm going to firstly talk about my background. Um, so to kick off with that, um, I studied my undergraduate degree at Durham University, which is in um, the north of England. Um, I graduated in 2021 um, with a degree in liberal arts, which, as the name suggests, um, basically meant that I studied subjects exclusively within the arts. So I did English literature and history and art history, all subjects that really um, nurtured my sense of creativity and helped me to um, develop skills in communication and writing and thinking critically. Um, so it was a really, really um, beneficial and enjoyable degree. But as I approached the end of my degree, I began to apply, as all students do, 
um, to lots of jobs and graduate schemes. Um, and the thing that they had all in common was that none of them or very, very few of them were related to STEM. Very few of them were within the field of STEM. Um, and that was because I assumed that I wouldn't be suitable um, as a candidate for jobs within STEM because of my arts background. I thought that careers in STEM were exclusively for students who'd studied STEM at school or at university. And, and as I said before, that was not me. Um, so when I first heard about the internship with OneStream, I was very hesitant to apply. Um, firstly, because OneStream was a software company and that was an industry that I had no experience in. I didn't really have a great understanding of software in general. Um, and I thought that, as I said before, that careers in STEM were for students with STEM backgrounds. And I hadn't studied STEM um, in, I'd studied it sort of in lower school, um, but nowhere near the level at university or anything like that. And another hesitation that I had was that I didn't know um, a lot about marketing. And that was the um, internship that I'd applied for. I knew that I had lots of skills that were transferable and that I'd gained through other experiences and activities um, that I knew would be useful in a marketing career. But my work experience thus far hadn't been directly relevant to marketing. So that was another smaller concern that I had. So. Those are my hesitations before I applied, but obviously I did give it a go. Um, and the reason that I did, I think it came down to three reasons, really. Firstly, that I knew that I didn't think that I would get it. And if I didn't, I knew that the application process would have still been a really good opportunity for me to get more interview experience that I could leverage for future applications and interviews. So I knew that if I wasn't successful, there'd still be a positive outcome. Um, secondly, I also knew that it's so important to push myself out my comfort zone and to try something new. In my case, that was applying for an internship within a software company. Um, but for other people, that could be something completely different. Um, but I knew that I should try new things and to push myself out of what feels comfortable and easy. And thirdly, I did believe that if I was accepted for the internship. From my own research that I'd done about the organisation, I knew that OneStream would be a really great company to do an internship with um, because of the company culture that really um, celebrated professional growth and development. So I knew that I would really, really learn a lot as an intern there. Um, and that sense of support in the company culture was really evident to me throughout my internship and made a really, really um, positive contribution to my overall experience. So I will briefly um, spend some time discussing three aspects of my internship with you all. Um, as well as gaining general business knowledge, I also um, supported the marketing team on different projects and events. Um, I took part in organising some sports related events for the brand ambassadors. Um, that was something completely different to anything I'd done before. Um, but I was still able to use some of the skills that I'd learnt and gained at school and um, through my arts background, things like time management and being organised. Um, and I was able to use these things in a different way. Um, but it does just go to show that for students with um, different backgrounds, there are still um, lots of skills that you've gained that are transferable to other industries. Um, secondly, I also gained lots of experience of digital marketing and um, particularly through um, creating social media posts and promotional emails. Um, this was something I did a lot of during the um, Women's Golf Open in Scotland, supporting one of our brand ambassadors there. And I was able to create content on social media. And again, that was something new to me, something I'd not done before. Um, but I was able to um, use some of the creativity and the written communication skills that I developed through my arts degree to create content that was engaging and persuasive. And another um, project that I just wanted to mention briefly um, was a project that really involved working a lot with data. And I wanted to mention that because that was something that as a art student, I didn't really do a lot of um, and something that when I was initially um, introduced to this, I thought, oh, I don't know if I'm going to be any good at this. 
Um, but I was able to, with the support of the team around me, learn and to understand the data that I was dealing with. Um, so I just wanted to share that with everybody, because even if there are things that you don't have any experience in, people around you are always really willing to give you the support that you need to understand these things and um, to be able to work on projects that could benefit those around me. Um, so just to conclude my very, very brief overview um, of my internship experience. Um, I was hired by OneStream in October after my internship and I'm developing in a marketing specialist role currently. Um, so that's obviously really exciting for me. I'm learning so much, still learning so much um, as I continue to support the marketing team. Um, and I'm also really thankful for the way that they're supporting me um, as they continue to help me to grow and to develop further. Um, so with that, I will hand over to my colleague, Matt, who will share his top tips with everyone. Thanks, Hannah. Just going to take control of the deck. OK, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Matt, as you've heard, and I work for OneStream Software as a lead technical education consultant. I'll explain what that means in a little while. For me, OneStream is a great company to work for, and every year they give each employee two days which we can use for any voluntary activities of our choice, and I choose to use mine with STEM in the UK. So in 2020, I became a UK STEM ambassador. So what I try to do with that is aim to support one STEM event every month, which could be doing a presentation similar to this or helping out with mock interviews, that kind of thing. And it's actually doing the mock interviews which have helped me generate my top three tips for teachers today. But first of all, I'd like to cover off my career journey into STEM, um, and then I'll go through the non STEM related opportunities at OneStream and finally the kind of STEM activities that I've taken part in. So as a, an overview of me with OneStream, I joined uh, OneStream software in 2019 uh, when there was roughly 300 employees. And then by the start of 2022, we've just passed a thousand employees. So we're growing pretty quickly. But what actually led me to OneStream? Well, I was uh, actually pretty average at school. Um, I did my extracurricular activities, so uh, activities outside of school. I was heavily into my swimming. I was in the air training corps thinking about a military uh, career and teachers said that I was university material, whatever that means. Um, but I got a bit distracted during those final senior qualifications and I completely underestimated the amount of effort that was needed to be successful and I failed. So despite my generally conscientious approach, something still went wrong, but that failure was what gave me my wake up call and made me realize that if I wanted to progress, then I had to apply myself. I needed to use a bit of discipline. So on the back of that one, I did manage to get a course at university and I was doing a degree in business quantitative methods, which is basically statistics. It wasn't really a course that inspired me. Um, it wasn't actually my first choice of course, but it was more education. I was applying myself to an objective. And then after university, I didn't really use the degree at all because I moved into a sales and customer services role for a few years. And then I moved into the banking industry where I was advising people on their savings, investments and retirement. Now, the message that I'm trying to get over here is that I started out taking a STEM degree, but a STEM career didn't immediately follow. And the other message that I wanted to put out is that in less than 10 years from leaving university, I'd changed my career twice. So with students, they seem to have a hang up about thinking about what they're going to do when they leave school. But what I found was what I chose to do on leaving school. It wasn't my first, it wasn't going to be my career for life. And so students uh, shouldn't pressure themselves into thinking that they're having to make that kind of decision. And that kind of takes me on to my first top tip, which for this one. Is personality profiling. I think it will be good to encourage students to undertake some kind of personality profiling similar to Myers-Briggs where you go through an assessment, you're asked uh, a lot of questions and it comes out with a four digit code. And this four digit code, the whole process is helping the students to understand themselves better, helping them to understand their skill sets and their natural responses to certain situations and crucially where their strengths lie. And this information can also provide insight into the type of careers that might be suitable for them. And with the personality profiling, remember to tell them to retake the test every two to three years. 
circumstances change and they change. So moving on, uh, after banking, I uh, worked with STEM in schools in the UK, which was promoting business and enterprise. That was another career change. And then I moved on to another career move into the world of EPM. That stands for Enterprise Performance Management or Business Performance Management. This is when uh, I joined OneStream as a trainer, and then I moved over to a department that creates the content for all of the training. It's technical and complex content, which is where my technical content developer title comes from. At OneStream, we use data science, technology, data engineering and maths. I'm currently working on a project which involves artificial intelligence and machine learning in order to forecast financial results for the future. It's true data science, but I'm not a qualified scientist. I know technology, but I couldn't build a computer and I know about software infrastructure, but I'm not an engineer. Maths? Yeah, I know about maths and finance. A STEM career at OneStream is so much more than just pulling apart an acronym. To make OneStream a success, we do need your archetypal STEM people, but we also need business people, teachers, lawyers, project managers, uh, admin staff, marketing teams, salespeople, people who look after people. The reality is that every career at OneStream uses at least one STEM skill in some way or another. And I love my job because I like to be creative and teach people about complex topics. I might be uh, creating e-learnings or videos or full training courses, online gamification, recording podcasts, that kind of thing. I get the chance to work with some fantastic people. I get the chance to travel around the world, pursue self-development, take time to volunteer for things that are important to me like this. I'm emotionally invested in OneStream software, which brings me to my next top tip. Ask what next? When I've participated in mock interviews, it was fantastic to hear the enthusiasm in some of the students as they talked through their aspirations. They had so much positivity about what they wanted to achieve. But when I asked them about what it meant for them, the what next part, they struggled to tell me why that aspiration was important to them. And this is the emotional connection that's missing. The emotional connection is what will make them buy into what they want to do next. So for all of us here, think about the last significant thing that you bought that brought a smile to your face. Was it a car, wine, house, shoes, a gift, a deposit for a holiday? Think about how you planned to make that purchase. You probably went through a process of qualifying why you needed to buy it. You made an emotional connection which took you a step closer to making the purchase. Now, what if you hadn't thought about why you should buy it? What if you hadn't made that emotional connection? You'd probably still be thinking about buying it. And it's the same with students' aspirations. They might want to do something, but what difference will it make to them? For example, I could get a student saying, I want to learn how to do coding. Great. So what's next? Well, I'll get better at coding. OK, what's next? I can build up my coding experience. And what's next? I can take a qualification in coding. What's next? I can apply for jobs in tech or coding. And what's next? Well, they're well paid and I'll be able to buy a better gaming PC. There you go. That's the emotional connection and that's going to drive aspiration in students. Now, the final thing that um, I wanted to talk about for my presentation was uh, the STEM activities that I've taken part in. Initially, as a UK STEM ambassador, I was quite nervous about engaging with schools, especially since my role isn't specifically STEM related. I wasn't sure what I could offer, but as it turns out, schools seem to want to explain to students that STEM isn't just about science, technology, engineering and maths. So I put my name forward for a three minute presentation and that one event rolled into many more. And since then, I've helped with other presentations and mock interviews, and I recently succeeded in securing almost 40,000 dollars in funding with the help of Nick on the call today to help underprivileged school children engage with online coding initiatives. The mock interviews really opened my eyes to a topic that close to my heart, accuracy. Everything I create is seen and judged by global audiences. If it's not engaging or accurate, my audiences quickly switch off and decide that my material isn't worth their time. 
In person, we've only got a few seconds to make a good impression, and it's even harder when you're not in person, which brings me to my final top tip. Proof personal statements. Accuracy is just basic politeness and an expectation, I think, when it comes to a job application. The potential employer will invest their time to read the application, and accuracy shows that the student has been conscientious enough to care about it, which might just be the difference between being one of the 10 people considered for the job or the first application that goes in the bin. At a recent mock interview, I spoke with a young lady about her aspirations to study English at college. And despite coming across as very intelligent, her statement was littered with grammatical and spelling errors. I'm not expecting 100% literacy for every job application, but for an English college course, I'm aware that students are encouraged to take part in extracurricular activities to make them stand out during applications, but for a student to deserve the opportunities provided by companies like OneStream Software, they need to demonstrate that they've made the effort in the first place. They need to be accurate. And that's my piece done with. So over to you, Nick. Thank you. I am just taking control. Lovely. OK, thank you. Um, it's great to, to meet everybody and, and be here today. Um, so before I go into, um, I guess, my top tips, I just wanted to provide a little bit of background um, for me and my work experience to date. Um, so I completed a degree in human resource management and secured a position with Bupa on their graduate programme where I was fortunate enough to rotate around different graduate um, HR teams. Um, after completing the graduate programme at Bupa, um, I joined TD Waterhouse, um, which is an execution only stockbrokers, and I was the HR consultant for their technology business unit. After a couple of years at TD, I guess I realised that I needed to um, widen my HR skill set. Um, so moved to a company called May Gurney, um, which, which is a utilities company. Um, and May Gurney um, recognised trade unions. Um, it was involved in a lot of mergers and acquisitions. Um, so I was really able to build my skills and develop in those, those areas. For May Gurney, um, I realised that I had a gap in my CV um, within a different industry, so moved to work at PwC um, and worked in the professional services sector, and I was the HR manager for the tax and assurance business unit. After a couple of years at PwC, I moved to Money Supermarket and I was their HR business partner for their technology team. And I think in all honesty, it was at this point whilst I realised that my passion really lied within the technology space. Um, I love the creativity, the thought leadership and the innovation that happens within this group. Um, so after um, Money Supermarket, I was invited to go back to, to PwC um, to lead on their technology degree apprenticeship programme. Um, so this programme was a first in its kind um, that used government funding to offer an apprenticeship programme that combined academic studies um, and work experience um, whilst offering a graduate role at the end of, of the programme. So after setting up this program, um, I then joined OneStream. Um, so I've been with OneStream since January 2020, um, and I joined OneStream to set up the, the HR function. You'll also see um, from the screen that there's a picture of myself and my two children. Um, I met my husband um, at TD when I worked um, as the HR consultant and we went on to have two children. So my little boy is 14 and my daughter is 10. Um, we've also got a three year old Cocker Spaniel um, who was behind the camera, as was my, my husband. So moving on to um, my my top tips for for students. Um, you know, 
ultimately, um, there's no such thing, I think, as the team has described as, as just one STEM career. There are a huge variety of roles within STEM. And I think it's really important to identify strengths to help discover the many possibilities that are available within the STEM world. So in terms of my um, top tips for students, to build on the point that, that Matt raised, um, CV writing. So ensure that the CV aligns to the skills um, that the role is, is looking for. So use practical steps, read the job description, or the role profile and pick out examples of how you feel you can demonstrate the skills and attributes that the role is looking for and make yourself jump out on the page so show who you are as a person don't be afraid of sharing your hobbies and interests and really showcasing who you are and what you like to do outside of work um, as Matt said, attention to detail is really important. So again, spelling, grammar and accuracy. And a top tip I would share would be to recommend that you ask somebody to proofread your CV before you send it to the organisation. In terms of interview preparation, um, again, I'd really encourage um, students to do their research. So look at the people on LinkedIn who are conducting the interview research the organization you know who are they what do they do what are their values um have a look at their social media channel channels what have they been promoting or sharing recently and um, you know my view is that this will be invaluable to show that you've really done your research again look at the job description so what skills are the organization looking for how can you demonstrate that you've got those skills one of the tips that I um, that I use and, and I have shared is called the STAR technique. So this way you ensure that you're succinct in your responses to the questions. So the STAR technique is basically situation, task, actions and results. So if you're asked a question, think about the situation, think about the task, speak about the actions you took, and what were the results? So what did you learn from being in that situation? And what would you potentially do differently if you're in that situation again? Um, also, have questions prepared that you would like to ask at the end of the interview. It's just as much your opportunity to understand whether that's a role that you're going to be happy in, that the organisation's values and culture fit with yours, so have some pre-prepared questions that you can ask at the end of the interview. Um, honesty is always the best policy. So what I mean here is always um, to be honest about who you are and what you enjoy. You absolutely want to secure the job knowing that you've been honest about your skills and experiences because that will provide a strong platform to build and to be successful in that role. Also, in an interview, if you don't know the answer to a question, that's OK. Just say that you don't know or ultimately say I haven't been in that situation. But if I were to be in that situation, this is what I'd do. So this is the approach that I'd take. Um, another tip of mine is feedback is key. So, um, you know, don't be afraid to ask for feedback, both positive and also developmental feedback on following the interview. So this will provide a great insight into, you know, what what went well and ultimately, you know, what areas of focus might you want to look at going forward? Um, and I would always say that no interview is a wasted experience. It's all great practice. Um, and again, you know, confidence and resilience. So throughout the process, remember, the more interviews you go for, we'll be always building your confidence and then also your resilience when you, you know, you potentially get the knockbacks. Both, you know, I view as vital skills to learn as you progress within your career. So in terms of my next slide, um, wanted to talk about the top tips for the IC for teachers. Um, so in terms of, um, you know, teachers, my advice would be help students to really focus on what they enjoy as well as playing to their strengths. So help students to identify the things that they enjoy 
and look for the synergies and the alignments with the role. Help them see what they're good at and also what they enjoy. I absolutely love the saying, you'll never work a day in your life if you love what you do. And it's OK if you do roles that you you don't love. You know, I would view that all part of, of the learning experience on your journey in terms of pursuing, you know, that career and, and finding that that role that you absolutely love. Um, I'd also say, you know, challenge, challenge the thinking. So don't be afraid to ask the questions of ask the questions for the students to really rationalise why they think they would like that chosen career. So myth bust and, and break down the stereotypical thinking about certain professions within STEM. So not all technologists write code and, and run testing scripts. Um, you know, as, as Matt's already shared, the opportunities are vast and wide. Um, you know, and there's all all host of opportunities to build successful careers and affect positive change whilst gaining real job satisfaction. Um, in terms of employability, encourage students to pursue extracurricular activities. So to really seek out opportunities to take part in, in activities that will enable them to gain transferable employability skills. Um, no experience is, is a wasted experience. Um, each application, each interview, each CV, each personal statement is all a learning opportunity. So really encourage the students to look at it from this perspective because that will really help to build the confidence and the resilience that I spoke about in my last slide. So I'd like to hand back over to Hannah now. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Let me just go on to the next slide. Cool. Um, so to conclude and bring our webinar and um, this part of the webinar to a close today, I'm just going to briefly share how um, my experience at school did help to prepare me for um, my internship. Um, so firstly, um, being involved in things at school that required me to manage my time well and to be organised, um, whether that was completing school projects or um, doing things outside of school with school clubs, um, learning to manage my time well and to meet deadlines um, really helped to develop um, my ability to be organised. And that's really helped to serve me well in the long run. Um, studying art subjects specifically, um, that really helped to develop my written communication skills. Um, it really taught me how to build a constructive and a persuasive argument throughout an essay um, to develop my writing. Um, and so that's been really, really helpful, particularly with marketing and the more creative um, things that I'm doing there. Um, whilst at school, I was also taught to think critically for myself. Um, I think this is really important for students to be able to form your own judgments and your own opinions um, about um, maybe about the topics that you're studying. Um, and often this is done through independent um, research and analysis. So for me, that was something that was really encouraged at school. And that really helped me to think things through for myself and um, to not just um, believe what I was taught, but to be able to challenge things and to form my own opinions about these things. And also, just as Nick mentioned, um, outside of academics, school also really encouraged us to have extracurricular hobbies and interests. And obviously, that's really different for everybody. Everybody loves different things um, and enjoys different things. It can be sport or reading or spending time with friends. Um, but for me, having those things um, in my life, those interests outside of academics, um, that gave me opportunities to um, develop a good habit of rest. And in doing so, my work was then more effective and more productive. Um, but also, as Nick said, it did give me a lot of transferable skills as well. Things like teamwork um, that are really um, transferable to other um, industries and to other contexts. Um, so there are some things that have been um, foundational for me. Um, but some other things that I wish I had learned at school or things that I wish that I'd um, understood. Um, firstly, to ask questions and to be confident to ask questions. I think school and university, it can be a really competitive environment and there are lots of different um, academic pressures and it's easy to avoid asking questions because you don't want to draw attention to yourself or you don't want to appear like you don't know or you've not put in the work. Um, whatever it is, um, I think people are very reluctant to ask questions. 
And so for me, as I began university, anything that I didn't really understand, I either just ignored or tried to figure out myself, which in some instances is a good habit to develop. Um, but as that went on, I realised actually how important it is to ask for help and how much I can gain from those around me by asking for their support. Um, and that's something that's been really encouraged um, at one stream during my internship and made such a difference to my learning that I was able to um, ask questions when I didn't understand things. The second thing that I wish I'd um, understood is that learning is ultimately a process. I think when you're a student, it's very easy to fall into thinking that you learn everything or you need to know enough about a particular topic in order to pass your exam or to achieve a particular grade in an exam. Um, but there's so much more that you can know about something and your learning doesn't just stop after you've finished your exams. Um, and I think this way of thinking does become quite unhelpful. Um, when you start a new job or an internship, you don't learn everything on day one. You don't learn everything in your induction week or your first month. It's so normal to have questions and opportunities to learn and grow as you go along. Um, so I think it's helpful for that way of thinking about learning to be um, encouraged from an early age at school. Um, and as I said, that's one of the things that I've really enjoyed about working at OneStream and um, that the team around me are very supportive um, of my learning. They encourage asking questions and supporting one another in resolving problems. And I think that sense of support can be really reflected in a company's culture. Um, so at OneStream, there are lots of opportunities for professional growth and development, not only for um, managers, but also for individuals like me who are just beginning their career. Um, so, for example, there are mentorship schemes, professional courses, and um, it's like leadership trainings and book clubs, lots and lots of things for employees to take part in and to grow from. Um, so I've spoken a little bit about why one stream for me, but why STEM? I mentioned earlier about my hesitation to apply for the internship um, because it was for a software company and how I just thought that I would stick with jobs and industries that I knew and that felt comfortable. Um, but working at OneStream has really challenge that in myself. As an arts graduate working in a STEM field, um, this has been a great opportunity for me to push myself out my comfort zone. And if I think back to me in school, I'd never have imagined um, that I would be working for a software company today. But marketing at OneStream, that's given me a great opportunity to be creative and to use the skills that I've gained through my arts background, but in a, in a different way, in a slightly different context. And it's also developed new skills in me um, as well. And another great thing um, to mention is that technology is a, is a growing industry. Um, it's growing so rapidly and it's a really great industry to be part of, um, especially for young people. I think a lot of the um, internships and apprenticeships and sponsored degrees, a lot of them um, are in um, technology. And so there's so many opportunities um, for students to kickstart their career with these different schemes that are out there. Um, so I would encourage any student who might rule out a career in STEM to think again, um, because there are lots of opportunities out there um, for you, even if you don't think that you are because of your background. And um, there's lots of things, as we've said throughout the presentation, that you can do. So just to conclude, um, I've touched on these already throughout the presentation, um, but just to summarise what I've learned along the way into three top tips. Um, firstly, I would also um, echo what Nick said and encourage students to be really honest about their skills um, and their strengths, but also about their growth areas. Um, I think for me, because I was aware that um, my background wasn't in STEM, I wanted to be transparent about that. I didn't want to pretend that I knew things that I didn't know. Um, so I did make sure that I was very transparent and ultimately that served me better in the long run because when I was hired, I know that I've not presented a fake version of myself. I know that I've been hired for me and I think that's really encouraging, especially when you are more aware of your weaknesses or your growth areas because you do feel more confident and able to ask questions because you know you've never pretended to know everything from the beginning anyway. Um, so I would really encourage people to be really honest about um, their growth areas. And my second tip, as I said before, would be to normalise that idea that learning is an ongoing journey. Um, it doesn't stop after you've passed your exam or after your first month 
on your internship. We're always learning and that's okay to always be growing. And thirdly, I would um, encourage students where they can to cultivate a really positive environment in the classroom um, where students are really empowered to ask questions when they don't understand things or maybe when they want to challenge like an idea or a concept. Um, and that will stand them in really good stead for continuing to ask questions and to be open to learning throughout their career as they go on. Um, so that draws our part of the webinar to a close. I'll hand back to the um, STEM Alliance team for the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hannah, for such an interesting presentation. And thank you also for sharing the challenges you have encountered while applying for a job. And I believe that many, many young people have found themselves in similar situations. I'm very, very confident of that. And Matt, thank you very much for being so dedicated in STEM activities. And it's always nice to hear that there are volunteers within the industry supporting students in their search for the new positions and also helping them improve their knowledge. And Nick, thanks a lot for valuable details that you shared. And uh, I really believe that this will be useful for our students as you gave some great, great examples from your rich HR partner experience. And before we start with the Q&A session, I just want to remind everyone once again to fill in the participation list to validate that you attended this, this webinar. We really need to prove that this webinar actually took place. So please uh, fill in also if you want to get the certificate of participation because this is the only way to get one. Um, now let's go to the questions. Uh, we have received uh, not so many questions here in the audience, so I invite you to ask your questions in chat now, but uh, we also have received some via email. Uh, today, Slavica from Croatia uh, answered, asked a question here in chat. Is it important for students to develop work habits and healthy life habits? Um, also, is it important to provide teachers with quality working conditions Teachers, uh, quality working conditions is something that we have not covered today. So what do you think? How important it is for teachers to be well equipped to, to prepare their students for STEM careers? Anyone would like to answer the questions? Matt, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, to try and get them prepared for it. Um, how to get them prepared, uh, prepared for it is the hard part, getting exposure to STEM organizations. Um, Honestly, I'm not sure how you would uh, you would try and do that other than going to perhaps trade shows um, where software companies or technical companies or STEM related organizations would uh, would showcase what they're doing. And that'll give you a chance to talk to them firsthand and find out what's going on. Um, I know we've talked about this internally at OneStream going along to careers seminars just to try and be there um, for people to inquire about what goes on at OneStream software. And if they were to ask, then I'd be putting up that slide that I showed earlier on, which de uh, demonstrated there's so many different um, areas of one stream that people can uh, can start careers in. Thank you very much, Matt. We also got a comment from Sandra who says that this is very interesting and challenging presentation for everyone. So I think she also values your your input. Uh, as we do not have at this point uh, any more uh, questions in the chat, I invite you to ask your questions, but let's go to the questions that we have received by emails from the participants uh, who were actually not uh, able to join us today, but they really like the idea and the topics that we are covering today. Uh, I believe that this question is uh, intended for Hannah as it mentions a mentor. So Hannah, did you have a mentor in your new team as your background is not really STEM related? Mm -hmm. Um, so I worked very closely with my manager um, my manager massively supported me throughout my internship um, was always there to answer questions and really helped me particularly through um, tasks or projects that were new or I needed extra support on and um, so I really benefited from our from her help. Um, I also had um, a buddy within our team who um, was really there just to get to know. Um, I think especially um, at the moment with so much of work life being um, online, it was really nice to have somebody in the team who I could just ask um, small questions to and get to know. Um, but I'm really excited because I've just started um, this year OneStream do a women's mentorship programme. Um, so I've just... Um, 
started that um, in the recent month. And my mentor is going to be Nick, who you've heard from today. So I'm looking forward to that. So from now on, I have a mentor, which is really exciting. If I hope that answers your question. It does. And it's great to hear that your mentor is here with us as well. So yeah. Nick, <laughs> as, as, as a new mentor, what can you tell us? What are your expectations and how will you support uh, how will you support your new trainee, feel I call um, Hannah that? Yeah, no, absolutely. I'm really um, excited to take on the role of, of, of mentor at OneStream. Um, I attribute a lot of my success to having people who were happy to take the time to support and coach and, and guide me. Um, I think my role as a mentor is to be that person who can, you know, provide very open honest um, and a safe place um, you know to share expectations to share challenges to share concerns and um, you know just to be that person who is at the end of the phone or the end of an email just to offer that support on the days where we've got a great win and then you know for the days where maybe things don't go as well and it's right okay let's talk through them let, let's understand what the situation is you know what what could we have done differently and and what can we we'll learn from that situation um for me i think it's also about being there um you know should hannah choose to talk about the work life balance side of things so to build on the question that i think one of the the the, the, the team asked earlier around that work life balance for students it's absolutely paramount and um, for us at, at one stream and again I would encourage it as well for students to be able to have that work life balance. We want people to come to one stream and be their true selves and provide provide that safe space where they can say I'm just popping off early today because I've got a you know a football game or a tennis game or from my perspective, I need to pick my child up from school. So again, you know, we are all humans as well as as professionals and we want to make sure that those needs are met as well. So it's something that one, we take really seriously at, at one stream for employee wellbeing. And two, I think the mentorship programme will further encourage that to disseminate through the organisation. Thank you very much, Nick. And uh, Hannah, I would say that you have a really supportive mentor, so it's good for I you. Agree. <laughs> I agree. I <laughs> agree. Thank you. I also see that uh, we have Jackie from the audience raising hand. Um, I actually didn't have a question. I just wanted to add to uh, the question you guys had earlier. How do you encourage people to get involved in STEM? Um, I'm a design teacher and so I'm really passionate about STEM and include a lot of STEM projects in my course. But and what I found is that especially amongst girls, there's hesitancy to get involved because they perceive it to be something that is maths related and focused really on analytical skills where what attracts them and they find exciting is very often more creative endeavors. And so I think it's very important to, to explain and show examples of how um, STEM related careers are also really creative, that it isn't just um, analytical, that in every career that we can enter, STEM or not, analytical skills are going to be used and required. And so um, you don't need specifically um, high levels of mathematics, et cetera. Um, Jackie, then, you're absolutely right. If I could just interject there, because earlier on I talked about these three minute presentations that I've done with some of my UK STEM activities. Yeah. And what happens with that? We maybe get three or four STEM ambassadors that come together to do a presentation. Often the ones that come in there, there's usually two or three ladies that are in there and it's fantastic to see the stories that they've come from um, a civil engineering background or they've gone into chemical or the oil and gas industry, that kind of thing. And to hear those stories and how they've taken that track through school um, that they weren't initially particularly interested in STEM, but it's just brilliant for schools to be able to see that kind of uh, recorded webinar to understand the platform of how we can try and get uh, young girls more interested in STEM uh, STEM careers. 
Yeah, absolutely. And also, there are so many really amazing opportunities out there. And, well, everything and you've just talked about there, Jackie, is that was one of the reasons why I gave my top tip as being personality profiling, because I yeah. went through this process recently with my son. He wasn't clear on what to do from uh, with school at all for his work experience, but I got him to do a personality profiling. That threw out some ideas about careers, which actually surprised him, which it was it pointing him towards STEM activities, which he'd really not had on his radar at all before. So that was why I, that was one of my uh, top tips. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, Jackie, for your question. Thank you very much for making this more interactive. And we have uh, received another question for HR. So, uh, Nick, this is for you. As an HR, did you maybe get some candidates that were excellent on paper, but not so good in practice? Um, honestly, yes. <laughs> um, and I think the reasons for that were probably due to, I think, the emotional buying piece that, that Matt spoke about, that, um, you know, it wasn't really, they weren't really very engaged in, in the opportunity. Um, I think that they had failed to do the research in terms of why this was an opportunity that they wanted, how this opportunity would then um, you know, meet their career goals and, and aspirations. Um, and it felt more like an application that somebody had been told to submit as opposed to something that they genuinely wanted to do. And I think when you're with somebody either face to face or virtually, you know, and you're on camera, you can really see that. Um, so I would say, sadly, yes, but on a positive note, I was able to give that person the constructive feedback. So hopefully they went on to have, um, you know, a successful um, experience after the one that didn't go so well with me. You know what, funnily enough, Nick, when I've interviewed people for jobs before, uh, there's one of the first things I do is actually ask people to talk through their CV or their resume, because often, like you say, people have been maybe pushed into a job application. Sometimes people haven't exactly been 100% honest in their and the mm -hmm. content of their their CV, and so by asking the uh, the candidate to read uh, to tell me about their CV, I'm holding it, I'm looking at it, but I want them to prove to me that they actually wrote the thing, because, like you've identified, sometimes they don't. Yeah. How do they react to feedback? Did you ever have did it, did you ever have situations when the feedback was more of a negative feedback, and then they were upset after that? Did that happen maybe? Um, negative, never, never negative. Constructive, maybe, but never negative. <laughs> but I, I so personally, how they it. yeah, I personally think that it's all in the positioning. So I like to give what I call the feedback sandwich. So what what went well? What are the areas that we need to work on? And then end it on a positive again. So I think, you know, it's really important to be sensitive that even if somebody hasn't been successful, that they have taken the time to invest and to imply and apply. And personally, I want everybody's experience, you know, when they apply for a role that I'm part of to walk away and think I might not have got the role, but that was a really great experience because I was treated like a person not just by you know not just like a, a piece of paper so personally i think you know there have been situations where people have come quite defensive to the feedback but i think when it's been positioned correctly then it has the positive impact that that i would i would have hoped for thank you for that and i think it's very important to get uh, feedback from the employer employer whether it's a potential one because uh, it makes you stronger, it gives you good tips for the future, and if you didn't get the job that time, that will give you some great insights. Why didn't you get it? And then you will have exactly. better and knowledge for that, the next Yeah, one. and building exactly. that confidence and that resilience that I think is so important because, you know, I've been in, in my career for a number of years now, and there's still things that, you know, I still actively seek out that, that developmental feedback because to Hannah's point, we're all still learning and, and that's good because that's how you, how you grow. So I think being open and receptive to feedback is, is a great trait to have personally and professionally. Thank you. We also have one question for Matt and that is about his STEM activities. So Matt, are you also active in STEM activities outside of UK or is it only local? I've looked at this 
um, trying to get active in STEM activities outside of the UK. Uh, and honestly, I've struggled a little bit. I um, I was having we've got a movement within one stream software called the diversity, equity and inclusion alliance. And as part of that, uh, it's where I met up with Nick actually um, originally, we were talking through how to promote STEM outside of the UK because we realized we've got colleagues that are working out of our France offices, out of um, out of Sweden. Uh, I don't think we've got one out of Brussels, unfortunately, at the moment. Um, German offices that we've got as well, Spanish offices, Italian offices, and we're thinking, you know, STEM isn't just about the UK, but we struggled to actually find a network in all that that was operating quite as strongly in those countries as STEM learning does in the UK. And uh, we found, or some of my colleagues, we found that they were proactively working with their local schools. There's one of my colleagues, he does um, a robotics class in his local um, preschool and just goes along there with a, a few volunteers from his local town. Um, but trying to find organisations to allow me to be more proactive with STEM in, in Europe, mainland Europe, I found hard, unfortunately. Well, I'm that's happy why we to came share. to you. Exactly, that was my, my <laughs> next point. So I'm very happy that uh, to share that also in the next couple of days you will be able to see a recording of Matt and one from one stream where he will be responding to questions from some students from all around Europe. One more time for everyone, if you haven't signed a signature list, this is the last moment to do so, so that you can also get a certificate of attendance for this webinar. Thank you everyone for joining us today for this one stream webinar organized by the STEM Alliance and Scientix. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you at our next event. Have a great evening, everybody. Thank you all.